In this video, I'll show you how to code the Newton fractal. We want to iterate Newton's method to find the cube roots of unity. So we need to find the zeros of the function f of z equals z cubed minus 1. We'll grid up the complex plane and iterate each grid point using Newton's method. z sub n plus 1 equals z sub n minus f of z sub n divided by f prime of z sub n. f prime of z is just the derivative of f of z and is given by 3 times z squared. Since Newton's method is going to be the computational engine of our code, we're going to start there. Here is Newton's iteration. Uh, z will be a matrix. The initial values of z will be the points in the complex plane where we want to determine the fractal. At the end of the iteration, each element of z should have converged to one of the three roots of unity. We're going to uh, iterate Newton's method uh, 40 times um, because uh, it doesn't take that long and that should be sufficient to converge all of the um, initial conditions. Okay, so now we go to the uh, top of the code. Um, we want to uh, put all of the initial conditions in Z and um, we want to define these functions. So let's start by defining the function. So um, our function f is going to be, uh, we use this um, syntax, add of z, uh, is, and the function is z cubed minus 1. So z is going to be a matrix, so z cubed, we need to use the dot hat operator, and that will be the function that defines the cube roots of unity. The derivative of this function, I put in fp, so that will be the derivative of z cubed minus 1, which is 3 times z squared. So that defines the two functions that we use in Newton's method. Uh, we might as well also um, set the roots at the top of the code. So the cube root of unity has three roots. Root 1 is 1. Root 2 is minus 1 half plus i times square root of 3 over 2, and root 3 is minus 1 half minus i times square root of 3 over 2. For the complex unit i, square root of minus 1, I like to write 1i um, when I use that because um, sometimes I use i as a variable in the code, uh, sometimes as an index variable. Uh, if you do that and you use i for the complex unit, then you can end up with a bug very easily. Okay, uh, next I want to set up the grid. Um, we'll start with uh, a thousand points in the x direction, which is the real axis, and a thousand points in the y direction, which is the imaginary axis. Uh, we'll look at a fractal from uh, minus 2 to 2 along the real axis and minus 2 to 2 along the imaginary axis. That will give us a, a very pretty picture. Um, the grid itself can now be uh, made. Um, so x then, we use the linspace function to um, divide x min and x max into nx points. And uh, y then is a division between y min and y max with n y points. The grid itself is in capital X, capital Y. We use the mesh grid function, a very um, useful function, which takes as its two arguments um, vectors, the uh, vector corresponding to the x values and the vector corresponding to the y values. And then it outputs two matrices, the matrix X corresponding to the X values on the grid and the matrix Y corresponding to the Y values on the grid. What we need are the um, X plus I Y on the grid, the complex numbers on the grid in the, in the um, complex space. And that I call capital Z, so X plus 
1i times y. So those are the initial values for Newton's method. So then we're ready to run Newton's method. So uh, here we then have the computational engine of the code, and we run Newton's method. Runs very fast because it does every value on the grid uh, each iteration. So you don't have to loop over the different values on the grid. You do them all at one time. OK, at the end of um, Newton's iteration, then, the next step is to, to determine uh, to which root each um, grid point has um, converged to. That's this next line of code. Um, so we set some small uh, parameter, epsilon. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, how small, but here I take it to be 0 0.001. And I define then four uh, what are called uh, logical matrices. We can concentrate on Z1, but we will have a Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. So for Z1, then I um, use the absolute value function, ABS. If the argument is a complex number, then that will be the complex modulus. Uh, we'll look at our matrix Z of converged uh, values and subtract from that the first root, root 1. So Z1 then will be a logical matrix. So if the element of Z has converged to root 1, then that element minus root 1 will be very small, will be less than epsilon. And that will be true. So Z1 then will get the value of 1 in that matrix element. But if the matrix element of Z did not converge to root 1, it converged to one of the other roots, then the modulus of Z, that matrix element minus root 1, will be large, will be greater than epsilon, and then this will be false, and Z1 will take the value of 0. So Z1 will be an NX by NY matrix that has 1s, where the initial conditions converge to root 1, and zeros when it did not converge to root 1. Similarly, Z2 will be uh, NX by NY logical matrix that will have 1s when the initial conditions converted to root two, converge to root 2 and the 0 otherwise. Z3 will have 1s when the initial conditions converge to root 3. And Z4 then, uh, being not Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3. So if there is uh, no none of, uh, if you did not converge to root 1, root 2, or root 3, you will have a 0 in that matrix element when you add them together, and not 0 will be 1. So Z4 will have a value of 1 at any um, point on the grid that did not converge to any root. Okay? So Z4 denotes non-convergence. OK, uh, with Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, we're actually uh, ready to try and plot a figure. So let me show you how we do that. We define, we open a figure to begin with. Then we need to define a color map. OK, so here is how the, this map uh, matrix works. Uh, the first row of the map matrix corresponds to how we want to color the number 1. The second row corresponds to how we want to color the number 2. The third row, the number 3. And the fourth row, the number 4. The 1, 0, 0 uh, corresponds to the RGB color system, red, green, blue. The first element is red has a, a value between 0 and 1. 0 means no red. 1 means full-on red. So 1, 0, 0 corresponds to the red color. 0, 1, 0 corresponds to the green color. 0, 0, 1 corresponds to the blue color. And then the uh, fourth row, 0, 0, 0, corresponds to the black color. No color at all. Uh, then we set the color map of this figure by calling color map of map. OK. So an image file, then, is supposed to consist of the numbers 1, 2, 3, or 4. And a 1 in the image file will get colored red. 
a 2 will get colored green, a 3 will get colored blue, and a 4 will col get colored black. So we need to construct that image file, and we can construct it from Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4 by setting Z, so I'm reusing the variable Z here. So Z then will be equal to Z1 uh, red plus 2 times Z2 green plus 3 times Z3 blue plus 4 times Z4 black. So Z will be then a matrix consisting of 1, 2s, 3s, and 4 where the 1s say we color that grid point, um, that uh, pixel say uh, red, 2 means we color that pixel green, 3 blue, and 4 black. Okay, that's our image file, and then we call image, then xmin, xmax just uh, defines the axis uh, in, in x, and ymin and ymax defines the axis in y, and we give it our image file z, so that will then uh, draw our figure. There's a small peculiarity of image. Um, people that do image processing usually define the image file starting from the upper left going down, um, while people who do numerics, like us, we usually have the y-axis pointing from uh, negative values to positive values, so going up. Um, the default then of the y direction for this image function is what's called inverted. If you don't use this last command, your y axis will be upside down, inverted. So you need this extra command to make it look uh, proper with the uh, negative on the bottom and the positive on the top. Um, you wouldn't know that necessarily, but then when you plot your figure and you see it, uh, looking poorly, uh, you can Google it and, and get that advice. Okay, then we got our figure, and the very last uh, step then would try to make the figure as uh, pretty as possible. Um, so I call axis equal, so the, uh, the spacing in the real axis is the same as the spacing in the imaginary axis, axis tight so that we don't have any uh, white region outside of our plot. Uh, I'd like the, the x ticks and the y ticks to have uh, five of them on uh, both the uh, real axis and the imaginary axis, so I uh, set the tick marks, and then the x label, y label, and then the title for the graph. When you write your code, you should make use of the MATLAB debugging tools. Let me show you here how to do that. Let's um, start with uh, a smaller grid, so uh, 10 by 10, so it makes the variables uh, more manageable. Um, I want to view the value of z every time that we change it in the code, so I'm going to put a breakpoint right after we uh, assign z. This first breakpoint, we would have assigned z to um, the grid points in the complex plane. And then we have this Newton's method iteration. And at the end of Newton's uh, iteration, I can put another breakpoint here. So it's the code stops before it executes epsilon equals uh, 0 0.001. And then at the end of Newton's iteration, z should have converged to uh, w one of the uh, cube roots of unity. Um, and then finally, the last place we assign z is when we assign it um, to our image uh, file. And then at this point, z will contain either one, twos, threes, or fours. Okay, let's run the code. So when you run the code, then um, it stops at the first breakpoint. All the variables that have been defined in the code are now in the workspace. Uh, we can look particularly at Z by double-clicking Z. This is a 10 by 10 matrix. Uh, let me take a moment now to uh, so that we can see all of the numbers. So here are the uh, complex numbers on our grid. 
we see that down the uh, first column, the uh, real part is constant at minus 2, and the imaginary part goes from minus 2 to plus 2. Similarly, if we look across the first row, the imaginary part is fixed at minus 2, and the real part goes from minus 2 to plus 2. So this was created using, uh, from the, using the mesh grid command. Okay, if we now continue in the debugger, we will stop at the next breakpoint. So I hit continue. And then Z changes its values. This is after 40 iterations of Newton's method. And we see that we have convergence, say, at the 1, 1 element to minus a half minus square root of 3 over 2i. Here at, at the fifth row, we have minus 1 half plus square root of 3 over 2i. And we can find some values of 1 also. Here are some values of 1. So we have convergence to one of the three um, uh, roots of unity. Okay, uh, we can continue. Um, at the next breakpoint, then we would have assigned z either the value of one, two, three, or four. So let's continue. We have a figure coming up, but we can uh, remove that. Now we see that z contains either 3 or 2. Here's or 1. Here are some 1s and 1s on the right-hand side. OK, so by using the debugging facility then, we can um, step through the code, uh, look at individual lines, look at what's happening to the variables, and examine the variables. Very useful. MATLAB has another useful tool that you can use that allows you to time the code and to, in, in particular, to look at the individual lines of your code and see how long it takes for them to run. Uh, so here we have a thousand by a thousand grid. Let's make it um, a bit longer to run with a finer grid. So we have an 8,000 by 8,000 grid. Uh, this button here, run in time, will then uh, run the code and at the same time uh, time the code and in particular tell you how long each line of this code takes uh, to run. What I told you before was that the Newton's method should be the computational engine of the code. So I would expect then that this line of the code is taking up most of the time. So let's give it a run. Here we get the profile summary from that run. Um, our function is Newton Fractal. We can click on Newton Fractal. Um, it tells us Newton Fractal took 35 seconds to run. And the lines where the most time was spent is indeed our uh, z equals z minus f of z over f prime of z line which out of the 35 seconds took 33 seconds. So 94% of the code is spent there. And we can have a look at the whole code at the bottom, and we can see that the red highlighted region, which is where most of the time is spent, um, is right on this uh, Newton iteration line. So when you have a complicated code that you're developing that might take a, a long time to run, you would like to use this timing uh, run in time uh, facility to uh, check your code, make sure you don't have some inefficiency in, in your code where something is taking a long time to run that shouldn't. And you should always aim that there's some key, for a numerical code, you should always aim that there is some key section of the code that is going to take the dominant amount of time to run. Let's have a quick look at our Newton fractal. Uh, remember that red are all the points in the complex plane that converge to 1. Green are all the points that converge to minus 1 half plus i, square root of 3 over 2. And blue are all the points that converge to minus 1 half minus i plus square root of 3 over 2. 
The boundary region here gives you this, uh, what's called a fractal. Um, it's a fractal because these structures repeat on all scales. So we can uh, zoom in here. If we zoom in to, um, to this piece of, um, of the graph, we'll see that this kind of figure here it shows up on smaller scale. We can keep zooming um, into this one on top. And uh, it's the same thing on a smaller scale, or we can zoom on this one here, and then it's the same thing on an even smaller scale. Here we're seeing the pixels, but um, you can go back into the code then and um, change the x min, x max, y min, y max to actually zoom in on this region, and you'll see that then you can continue downward and see more and more of the same. Let me go out. Uh, definitely uh, one of the more, more beautiful uh, fractal images. I hope you've learned how to build a somewhat more complicated code. My style of coding is just one approach, and others may do it differently. It doesn't really matter as long as your code is accurate, fast, and preferably readable. You can play around with the code by changing the function f of z. If you find something interesting, go ahead and post your result on the discussion forum. I'm Jeff Chasnov. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.